Thursday Night Tailgate, where the spotlight is always on the positive. Tune in Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time to hear your favorite NFL legends, players, and coaches sharing their stories. Now back to Chris and Bob. I wouldn't joke about anything else that happened to you tonight. And now back with us here on Thursday Night Tailgate is Tony Mandrich. We had Tony on the show a few weeks ago, and he was so riveting, and his story of recovery was so amazing. We just didn't have time to get into all the other things that we wanted to get his insights on, so wanted to get him back on the show as quickly as we could, and he's gracious enough to come back tonight. Let me remind you quickly about his background. He is from Oakville, Ontario. He is the highest-drafted Canadian-born player in NFL history. He was recruited to play his college ball at Michigan State by then defensive backs coach Nick Saban, who is a first-team All-American, an Outland Trophy an Outland Trophy finalist, and a two-time Big Ten Lineman of the Year. A first-round draft pick, the number two overall selection in 1989 by the Green Bay Packers, and he played for the Packers from 89 to 92. He then came back to the NFL in 1996 and played for the Colts through 1998, starting all 16 games in 97. He now runs Tony Mandrich Creatives, which, oh, by the way, folks, is absolutely unbelievable. you got to go online and check him out. He's a digital artist and a photographer and a public speaker and trying to help others learn from his life experiences. And like I say, we are honored that he is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Tony, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the hey, show. Tony. Well, it's my pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me again, and I, I'm glad you invited me back because the last time I think I was a little bit long-winded on a certain subject. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. That's why we said you're so fascinating. We wanted to have you back. So, Tony, no, last time we good. talked a lot about the challenges, you know, that you went through over the course of your career and staying clean and staying sober. I, I, I wanted to get a thought from you. When, when you look back at, you know, where you were when you sort of hit rock bottom, was there a moment in time when something took place that you either said to yourself or someone else said to you, you know what, Tony, enough is enough. You got to get help. Yeah, there was there was a, a, a like a critical mass, if you want to call it, where a friend of mine and I wish he could I could say he said something profound that makes the story sound better, <laughs> but he basically had told me what hundreds of people had been telling me and trying to help me in the years past, and even in Green Bay, uh, even internally, and just you know people saying you know you know, you're struggling with something or whatever. Well, you know, this guy that talked to me was my buddy. He was my workout partner. So, you know, I was a little bit more trusting of him. And he pretty much had said, you know, if you, if you don't stop what you're doing and if you don't stop all the drinking and drugging with the uh, you know pharmaceuticals, he's like, you know, you're going to die. He goes and he's like, and, and worse, you're going to live and you're going to be sitting here on this couch three years from now just like you have been for the last three years. And when he stated the time period, I was like, I've been out of the NFL for three years, and and it seemed like I was out for six months. So it was like a three, you know, that those three years were extremely blurry, not as blurry as the decade, but even more blurry. Um, and that was kind of like the baseball bat across the face, kind of like wake up, and, you know, I told him, and I remember sitting there, we were having a beer, um, and and I remember uh, saying, you know what, I'm not going to make a knee-jerk reaction decision. Let me sleep on it, and I'll, you know, I'll give you an answer for sure in the morning. And you know, as the day went on, I was just like, you know, God, I've I've been on a this really bad losing streak for, <laughs> and the kind of you know common denominator has been me and alcohol and painkillers and it's like so you know it was like i'd already kind of made my decision or was 99 percent sure that night so when i woke up the other morning i was you know thoroughly like yeah i mean i'm so i mean i i literally i mean i literally did this what i'm about to describe i got in front of the mirror and i was disgusted with what i saw and i was like you know what you've done to yourself and what you haven't done to yourself as far as, you know, you just, you know, you embarrassed your, the career and, and, uh, the sport of football, the Green Bay Packers, who are, you know, probably one of the greatest traditions in the NFL. Um, 
and you've embarrassed your family, you've embarrassed your the people that love you, all, all that stuff. The least person I cared about was me as far as who I embarrassed because I can handle that. It's all the stuff that was around me that was really, you know, painful to start to see. And I hadn't even gotten, like, physically sober yet. So, and I was, you know, basically sick and tired of me pointing the finger at everybody. I mean, I pointed it at the Packers, the media, you know, my wife, my kid, my mom, my dad, my brother. It didn't matter who it was. It was never my fault. But why am I having such a you know, bad losing streak here over a decade or over, you know, seven or eight years. And, um, and, 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 you know, you know, guys, I knew in the last, I would say four years of my drinking and drugging, I knew that that was the problem. I mean, I literally knew that was the problem. And, um, and I tried to quit hundreds of times different ways and it just, you know, would always fall back uh, on it. I mean, the disease of alcoholism is, or addiction, if you will, um, is very, you know, they, they use a phrase of that it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. And, and, and here's a short, quick example of how your disease talks to you. Um, you know, one day, and this was two years before I got sober, I was like, that's it, I'm done. And I'm just going to go cold turkey. And I did. I went like 15 or 16 days. So the physical withdrawal was already gone after about 10 days, and I was starting to feel better. And I was starting to, like, have more energy to do stuff, and just my outlook was getting better. And then that voice inside my head said, obviously, you don't have a problem because you can control it. You just went 16 days without a drink or a drug. So surely you can have one. And and I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I had one, and then that's the one that messes everything else up. Because if you have one, you're like, well, now that I've had one, I could definitely have two or three or six or 12, you know, and, and you're off and running again. And, Tony, you talked about how last time how you came back in 96 and you caught on with the Colts. So the the opposite side of, you know, all the bad things, Something said to you, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to get back into this thing. I'm going to get myself straight and sober. I'm going to get myself back in shape and I'm going to give this thing another run. Talk about the, the idea and the strength to be able to do that. You know, looking back, it's like, you know, I mean, looking back at that time period, it even amazes me sometimes that it actually happened. Like that, that first of all, it, it amazed me that sobriety happened because that was impossible for me. It was just like one of those things that I just accepted. And I was like, I'm going to, you know, die a alcoholic, a drunk, or, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm homeless or in a home. And homeless was just a matter of time if I would have kept drinking and drugging. You know, when I, and when I got sober, I left that treatment center, you know, at about 250 pounds. You know, six six two two fifty. I played it like three ten, and you know, and I, you know, my skin had a like a shade of yellow on it, and it was just, you know, just because of all the detoxing that my body was doing, and my kidneys and liver were under huge stress from, you know, their liver enzymes were high just from all of the stress that you would put on your body through chemicals, and the last thing on my mind was to come back and play. I was I had no intention. If somebody would have asked me, I said absolutely not. Um but as ninety days went by, you know, you get a lot more clear headed. Um although you're not even close to clear headed until about uh, at about two or three years my head pretty much cleared up as much as it did. Um but after ninety days, you know, I'm actually laughing and actually enjoying life, and I'm not having to put a chemical in my body to do it. And my outlook on life is incredible. And, like, it's like, yeah, I did, you know, this pro thing, I did this, and, and was all American, and all that stuff is great. But in a, in a world back then and today, we live in a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately for world, you know, who, you know, it's nice to acknowledge, but really, who cares anymore? It's like, what are you doing today? And, and, and my thing was at 90 days, uh, you know, I had done some self inventory and on my previous 10 years and the mistakes that I'd made, but also I had done some good things too. You know, it wasn't like I was out 
the bars every night fighting. It's like, you know, the, the stereotype of an alcoholic for me was the total opposite of what I thought. And, you know, like the stereotype would have been a guy in an overcoat in an alley in the middle of summer and it's 100 degrees out. Like that's my stereotype of an alcoholic. And, you know, today you have Fortune 500 companies that are made, that are billion and billion, multiple billion dollar companies and CEOs that are active alcoholics that are running the company and they're just hiding it. And it's just a matter of time and until, it, you know, the, the floor falls out from underneath them. But the, the thing was, when I realized how much damage I had done, and again, I could give a rats, you know what, about myself. I was like, what have I done to the, you know, the fans that were loyal, that whole front office. And, you know, that being said, more importantly, my family. What if all the, all those things I did wrong? And I was like, I need to correct, you know, you need to correct these things. And, and that's basically part of the 12 steps. I mean, is, is taking that self inventory and 12 step, you know, people, a lot of people don't know what they are. Some do, some will shirk at them. And hey, listen, they're a guide for living. And you could take the word alcohol out of each step and just use it as a guide for living. And it's basically 12 principles on how to be a good person and do, you know, do stuff right. And if you do somebody wrong, make it right. You know, so and pretty much that's it. And then for us, it's like, and don't drink, you know, and don't drink. So um some of the things that I had done wrong, I could make right. Some of the things I had done wrong were just impossible to make right just because of a circumstance or the nature of what the wrong was. So I was, you know, I was like, well, how do you make it, how do you make it right? Uh, or as right as it can be to go back and play and kind of like keep your mouth shut instead of being an arrogant SOB. And, you know, if you're lucky, get a workout with a team. Um, and then if you're lucky, get signed. And if you're lucky, you know, make the team. So it was, you know, it was a very interesting, in a 90 day period, you know, that had started to sway because, and it wasn't just with football, it was with a lot of people that I had wronged. Um, like I made amends to my mom in like almost in the first month because I knew my mom would say, it's okay, honey, I love you. But I didn't make amends to my dad for four years. I was sober for four years before I sat down with my dad, I would say for four or five hours. And it, and it was, you know, just, you know, talking and it was, and it was nothing about what he did. It was about my side of the street and the wrongs that I had done. And whether he did wrongs to me or not is not what we were talking about. That was not the reason I was there. We were there to talk about the wrongs I had done and to try to make them as right as, as it could be made and rebuild that relationship. And, um, and, and, you know, so, you know, what stopped me? Why did I wait four years? Well, it's fear. Right. You know, it's like a fear of, of, you know, walking up to your dad and then tell him, you know, tell him to go hit the road. Um, because until you hit the road, it's like, I can't, you know, talk back. I'm here to try to make it right. And if, if I've hurt him so much that he can't be made right, I've at least done the action of trying to make it right. And, and that has happened with other circumstances for me. But with football, the question, you know, million dollar question was, how do you make that right? And, and, and the answer for me came with go back and play. If you're lucky, like I said earlier, if you're lucky even to get a workout. And, uh, if you do, you still got to make the team. Doesn't mean you're in. And then, of course, I'm not going to come. I, my intention is not to come back and just play and make it right. It's to, to play, to actually play the game and start and, and, you know, I knew I could play the game um, uh, without steroids. Uh, you know, the, the the years I took steroids were in college. I'd never, you know, never taken a steroid. And my last steroid was taken 12 weeks before the NFL Combine because I wanted to make sure that everything was out of my system for because I knew they were going to drug test at the Combine. So, you know, this was, you could say, a new experience for me. But... I never thought I could get sober. I thought it was literally an impossibility. And, you know, the miracle happened or the act of providence happened, whatever you want to call it. It happened. And, 
there was no great white light for me. It was it was a Louisville, an, an imaginary Louisville slugger over my head. And I heard what I heard when I was ready to hear it. And um, and then realized that I was, you know, the common denominator and of all those problems. So when I did get an opportunity, uh, Philadelphia was flying, a scout from Philly was flying from West Coast to East Coast, and he had like a six-hour layover in Cleveland. And Ray Rhodes was the head coach of the Eagles. And, you know, my agent had reached out and said, hey, look, can you, you know, give Tony a workout, you know, and I've been out of the league three years laying low, you know, being basically in a cave. And they're like, well, where's he been? What's he been doing? And they're like, well, we're not flying him out. We're not I'm basically saying we're not going to waste two or three or four hundred dollars flying him out to Philly. And and the crazy thing about it, when you think about it, is that's 1995, 96. You know, six, seven years prior to that, I had my own combine. You know, I was like, I'll go to the Indianapolis combine for all my interviews and my drug tests and my physical, but I'm going to do all of my physical running and testing and workouts at Michigan State and basically buy myself four or five more weeks of training, um, you know, to, uh, to perform as well as I can at my own personal combine or what they now call pro day. I don't even think they called it pro day back then. Um, and, 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 you know, it was like, it was, for me, it was a God shot of, yeah, there's no doubt God has a sense of humor because look at where you were and look at where you are. And the craziest thing about this story and the, I, that I feel is the best part of that part is I was grateful to even get an opportunity and I drove eight hours to Cleveland because the scout had a layover the next day and I worked out in a gymnasium of a local community college. I want to say uh, just on the outskirts of Cleveland. I can't even remember. It was a, it was a wealthy neighborhood and it was a private, I want to say it was a private college, but I worked out literally on the basketball court for this scout. And I'm sure that this scout was like, this guy's a pain in the ass. I got to go from the airport to this place. I got to watch him work out. And, and then I got to fly, uh, drive back to the airport and then get back to Philly. So, I get done with the workout and, you know, I, I had, I got myself back up to 300 pounds in, in nine, 10 months and got stronger again and probably got to within 10% of my strongest ever in my life. And, and the key for me was I knew I could do it because I was watching players that played my position that fall when I was sober. And I was like, I'm better than that guy. I, right now, I'm better than that guy. All I need is a year of footwork and practice and repetition and, and constant, you know, getting back into the system. But, you know, I was thorough in burning, burning all of my bridges. I was like, you may never get an opportunity. Why should they give you an opportunity? Because you were such a SOB. And, you know, we're, you know, the guy I had the workout and the Philly scout was like, okay, what's going on? Like, where have you been? Like, what is going on here? Because, you know, you had a, you've had a great workout today. You know, I didn't do a 40 because we didn't have room, but all the agility drills and the O line drills and my bench, like I think I benched 225 like 36 times at the comma and I did it like 39. Um, but I think the key was when he spoke with me and had conversation with me, he saw that my eyes were clear. Not that he even thought that I was you know, had a problem of drug, you know, addiction or, or alcohol abuse, but he could see that I was, you know, what you see is what you get. And, you know, um, I drove as I was, you know, as when I got back to Traverse City, Michigan, where I was living, you know, Ray Rhodes had called and said, we want to fly you out uh, in two days um, to come here. We want to sit down and talk to you. We want to work you out again and, you know, talk about potentially coming on with the Eagles. And I was like, you know, yeah, you know, trying to play it cool. And when I get off the phone, it's not it's like that inner child inside of you. It's like you think you'd want to be jumping and like being like, holy, you know, crap, I got an opportunity because all I needed was a chance. But I was like, put the phone down. There was just calmness. And it was like, can you believe that this is actually happening? 
Wow. And because, because I was like, there's no way. I, if I was an executive at any of the NFL teams or a head scout or a GM, I would be like, I wouldn't touch that guy with a 10 foot pole. All he is is a cancer on a team, you know, and, and they gave me an opportunity. And I think the reason they gave me an opportunity was because Ray Rhodes was in Green Bay when I was in Green Bay before he got the head coach at a job in Philly. And then what ends up happening is, you know, the NFL, as big as it is, it's a very tight, small network and word got out that I had a good workout. The next morning, Indianapolis calls and says, um, we want to fly you down today to Indianapolis to, to work out. Um, and I was like, absolutely. I, I was not in a position to negotiate. I was, I was like, absolutely. And flew down there, you know, spent the night the next morning, worked out. I told them everything. Um, and I told them, uh, you're getting damaged good because there was, there's, you know, there's almost a decade of alcohol abuse and, 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 um, uh, you know, painkiller abuse and all this stuff. And I said, so you're getting damaged good. And I said, and the doctors and the do one doctor was in the meeting when I had my meeting in their training room. And this was after my workout and I had a great workout in Indy. And I said, you know, I, I don't want to hide anything. I don't want you to hear it from anybody. And you're going to hear it from the horse's mouth. I said, you're getting damaged goods and it's a chance you're going to take if you take it. So that, you know, there's nothing that you're going to find out about me. It's not going to be like, you know, oh, you know, we found out something and why didn't you tell us that? And, and, and for me, it was like, Hey, this is a new way of living. So they need to know. And this should not be hidden from them because if they invest, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into you, they need to know about their investment in the product right. that they're getting. So, you know, I told them and they were very gracious about it and they were very, um, you know, pleased that, that I had, you know, revealed that. And, um, it wasn't 30, you know, I was, I had showered and I was just getting ready to leave the facility. I was just, you know, the, the trainer or the equipment guy there was a Michigan State guy. I had never met him. But he was a Michigan State guy who was uh, years ago, so he was, you know, he just got me some like T-shirts from Indianapolis just to have, because you know we didn't know what would happen. And um, you know, the scout comes back and says, you know, this long piece of paper that looks like a piece of paper, like when you buy a car, right? It's like, God, how many times do I have to sign this thing? And he's like, Look, man, uh, you got a second, and so he pulled me aside. He's like, We want to sign you to a two-year deal. And if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, when they do their slow-mo stuff, it's like, you know, life's full speed, they're fighting, and then all of a sudden everything goes into that Matrix mode, and it's like the whole world stops, and everything's moving slow. You can hear people talking, but you're just, like, in a different zone. And I, you know, I had thought, you know, I was in the Indianapolis locker room, and I, and I was, it was February, so it was, you know, nobody was there. And I thought to myself, this is a, is a direct result of sobriety. This is why, um, I was, you know, even given a chance to come back. Um, so I, I didn't have any confusion. I was crystal clear that it wasn't about my physical abilities. It was about, you know, living right, doing the right thing. Um, and, you know, and I always kept saying to my wife at the time and to a few people that I was just tight with, because I'm very much a private person, I said, oh, man, it, all I need is a chance. If I get a chance, and I said, I know I can do it. I know I can do it because sobriety was impossible and it happened. And not only did it happen, but I'm living an incredible life. And I thought, you know, even if I don't get a chance, even if I do get a chance and don't make it, at least I can close the chapter saying you gave it your all, you weren't good enough or whatever the case may be, and move on. You know, what's next? What's next on the agenda? And because, you know, life doesn't stop after football. Most of your life, very little, small part of your life is pro football. Um, and uh, I had said to him, you know, 
can you give me 24 hours to think about it? I just want to discuss it with my wife and just, you know, just talk about it with her, but I'll have an answer for you guys by tomorrow morning. And, and they, he wasn't surprised. He, they were, they were cool. They were like, absolutely not a problem at all. And, you know, and, and here's the thing where I'm going to, you know, now just very, very briefly delve into, you know, what I was taught in sobriety. It was like, don't make any rash decisions without talking to somebody who's been, you know, sober a lot longer than you, somebody you respect, somebody that lives life and has character the way you aspire to have and all these things. So basically what it's saying is, you know, no different for you guys. If you're going to look up to somebody that has good character, is a great community person, um, is always done right, you know, by family and, and you're going to say, Hey, look, I just want to run something by it. Whether it's a business thing, it doesn't matter what it is. It's somebody's, um, on, and they'll give you an honest, objective opinion because they're not emotionally involved. So I talked to a guy that was like 45 years sober who I would see at, at AA meetings and it would, he wouldn't talk much, but when he talked, it was gold coming out of his mouth with the words he was saying. They were like the, like the wisdom and simplicity was incredible. So I was like, I'm going to, and you know, he was more of an acquaintance than a friend and, and you know, he was in his, I want to say almost 70. And I called him and I said, Hey, look, I said, I got some, some pretty big decision to make here and I need to run it by you as an objective opinion. And I need to hear uh, what you have to say. Cause I don't, the biggest thing I don't want to risk is my sobriety and millions of dollars don't matter to me. Um, it's the sobriety that matters because being in that hell is worse than, you know, being dead. It's a living hell. Um, living the way I did and, and, for, you know, current people that are, you know, pra- you know, unfortunately in that place right now. I explained everything to him and, you know, he, he was a very, you know who he was like? He was like Mick from Rocky. He was like, like Rocky's trainer, Mick. Wow. Like that's the kind of guy he was. Okay. And he looked at me and I think he was shocked that had 11 months of sobriety that I had had my head clear enough to be able to say stop and ask a question of somebody who has been around because my normal knee reaction would be like, heck yeah, where do I sign? You know, when they offer it to me, but they always say, no, you know, try not to make any major decisions um, without talking to a sponsor or in this case, somebody that you respect. Um, so when I talk to him, but, but, but the funny part, you know, the story within the story there is how do you tell the scout that? Right. So that's why I said, I'm going to talk to my wife about it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking in my head, how do you tell your sponsor? I mean, how do you tell the scout who's offering you a two year deal? Obviously from the front office, uh, I got to talk to my sponsor first. He's going to look at me all confused because, you know, I mean, why should he know about how, you know, 12 step programs work unless he has a friend in one or unless he's in one. So it was again, humor within the day for me. It was, and, and when I was getting done with my conversation with a, uh, older gentleman in Traverse City and, you know, he was 45 years sober and he listened. I mean, his trait of listening was incredible. His eyes would never wander. He was listening and he would listen and, um, he wouldn't talk like, you know, there wasn't texting, but he, he wouldn't talk to you and have a conversation and check his text or he wouldn't, you know, he was, it was sit down and listen. Like, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And, you know, I, I knew his time was valuable. And, and I said, uh, my concern, I said, you've seen what's happened last 11 months because you were there when I came in. I said, but my concern is going back into the NFL and, um, you know, being around the money again, being around the, you know, um, celebrity, the, you know, the fame, if you will, um, the perks and all the other things that come with being in the NFL. And my concern was slipping back into that world of ego and start starting to, you know, start drinking again. And he looked at me and he basically had said, you know, to wrap up the story, he said, 
let me take you to this page in the book, and it's the, the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's on page 86, where the founder says, we can go anywhere, any place, any time, and do anything, as long as our motives are correct, and as long as we're spiritually connected. And and he even refers to in the book, you know, you can walk in, you know, you can have, doesn't mean you can't go to a bar and have dinner. I mean, it's just part of life. It's part of society. Other people's drinking is not my business. My drinking is my business. The only time someone else's drinking becomes my business is if they ask for help. So he said to me, God didn't get you sober to sit your ass in Traverse City, Michigan and go to meetings. He said, you know how many people you can help by doing this the right way this time? So uh, I got my answer from him. And I was like, yeah. You know, and I was like, and again, it was one of those, is this really happening moment? And and everything yeah. he said to do, I did. And he just, you know, he said, when you go down there, he's like, just go to a bunch of different meetings, find the ones you like, go to those. You know, you're going to find one or two guys that have good sobriety and that aren't pissed off all the time and that are living a quality life. And those are the guys you ask, you know, that you kind of, work with or that you check in with or just kind of like it's it's just like having a best friend and just kind of being like holding each other accountable for like hey look i think you bullshit yourself here you know and so you know and that's you know that's what happened and the and and the rest you know is come back and at the press conference they wanted to do a press conference right away the media did i didn't want to do it i said give me a few months to settle in and, and then they were fine and like two weeks before the draft they had a press conference for my signing and I had to resign two months prior to that. And then one, you know, one of the questions and this gentleman who was a beat writer for the Colts ended up being a good friend. But one of his questions was, you know, aren't you embarrassed to come back and make a, the minimum wage your first year, 196,000 is a going into your fifth year as an NFL player. And then the next year, uh, making 500,000 where the, when you left the league, you were making a million dollars a year. And I thought to myself, you have no idea how lucky I am even to be here. And I was like, I was grateful dumbing it down and keeping it simple and just to be given a chance. And you know what? I didn't go back. I made, I went back to slay demons for myself and to make things right. Like, you know, for the wrongs that I had done. But I didn't go back to say I'm sorry, if that makes sense. Because there's a yeah. huge difference between saying, look, I was wrong, and and then and a huge difference in motivation, too, between saying I was wrong and saying I'm sorry. And it wasn't a comeback for, hey, I hope you like me now, and, you know, that you can pat me on the back and think I'm a good guy. Because, you know what, I have a lot of flaws. And they were exposed, obviously, nationally. And and I still have flaws. And we all do. We're human. But it's, you know, you know, mine obviously were out of control at the time and almost killed me, you know, multiple times with self-sabotage. So, you know, we and I and I talked and I spoke with that beat writer, you know, probably, you know, the last year I was there and I told him that story. Um and, you know, I'm not even sure the media knew I was sober and that that's what would happen. And, um, and, uh, and he was like, God, looking back, that is a funny question. And he goes, I can totally see, like, you know, you were just living in hell for seven, eight years and now you've got an opportunity to play. So it's like, yeah, okay, you're getting paid 196 grand, which is fine. I'm good with it. I just want to come back and play, play my demons, you know, try to make things right with the wrongs I had done with the NFL and, you know, try to lead an example and help people if they want help. And, and, well, and, great and, stuff, Tony. and, and it felt like, and for me, it felt like it happened and it, it happened. And after three years, you know, retirement was forced with a shoulder injury and it was kind of a sign for me of like, Hey, look, done your job. You've done what you're supposed to do. I wanted to do it for longer, but it was like, you know, you've done it. And it's time now to move on and, um, you know, do the next thing. And what that thing was, I had no idea. Uh, but I trust it. And, you know, and I do today. So I'm very lucky. I'm a very, Tony, I'm very fortunate, you know, to, to be able to share stuff like this. Indeed. Well, Tony, thank you so much for coming back and, and, you know, updating your story and going a little bit further. It's, uh, 
it's always interesting and uh, we learned something very profound having you as part of the show. Thank you for doing it again tonight. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks again. Take Tony. care, Tony. All the best to you and All your right family. Then. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. That is uh, former Michigan State and pa Packers and Colts offensive lineman Tony Mandrich. And uh, Bob, no matter how many times Tony is a part of the show, it's uh, it's always very moving and very touching and and uh, educational on some level to have him uh, share his story. An incredibly profound stuff, Chris. It goes beyond the gridiron and uh, is riveting. It really is. It's the only word that comes to mind. Indeed. And our apologies to uh, to John Bach, and we had John hanging on the line, and uh, but uh, we'll get John back on the show hopefully here real soon. That uh, we appreciate his thoughtfulness and his patience, and uh, but uh, a great story from Tony Mandrich. All right, folks. Uh, on the other side of these words from our friends at DP Quality Foods and the Salt Creek Golf Retreat, Bob and I will be back, and we'll do our Thursday night tailgate spotlight on the positive, and then we'll wrap up the show. 